is uh, Matt Berkowitz. I'm one of the coordinators of uh, Zeitgeist Vancouver, the Vancouver chapter of the global Zeitgeist movement, which now has uh, chapters in nearly 100 countries and over 1,000 cities worldwide. Um, I first became uh, interested or aware of the Zeitgeist movement after discovering Zeitgeist Addendum online, it's the second film in the series. And uh, the message really resonated with me. Um, I felt quite alienated from the values in, in modern society, from the inquisitive, materialistic values that, uh, that many people uphold. And as such, had sort of found solace in, in, in underground music. And I very much related with uh, many of the values and, that are advocated uh, by the Zeitgeist movement. So I went to work right away for the next several months uh, researching uh, pretty much everything addressed in, in both of the Zeitgeist films, trying to get my hands on everything I could. And it became very clear to me right away that um, the, the, the uh, direction that the Zeitgeist movement proposes in terms of a resource-based economy was critically important information. So I, uh, I, need, I knew I needed to get involved in the Vancouver chapter. So uh, we, had our first, uh, Van we had our first event here in Vancouver, March 2009. We had a screening of uh, Zeitgeist to Denim. That was for our, our Z-Day event. And uh, a couple months after that, we had our first uh, activism event in terms of actually uh, spreading awareness to new people. We set up for one of the local festivals in, here in Vancouver. And pretty much from then, uh, we've been active on a weekly basis, uh, spreading this information to uh, new people, as well as giving lectures to people who want more information, and, and so forth. That's pretty much how I got involved. And how do you see the current global economic condition? You know, destruction of the environment, for profit gain, unequal distribution of wealth, unemployment, job loss, diminishing government services, rising health care costs, and so on. Yeah, I mean, all of these things, war, poverty, unemployment, income inequality, all of these things can really be traced back to the, the governing social paradigm. And it's important to, to focus on these issues, but it's even more important to trace them back from, from where they originate. And that's where the socioeconomic system that essentially governs the entire world comes into play. To, uh, to borrow from uh, Dr. John McMurtry, he, he says we live in an anti-economic system. And essentially what that means is it's basically inverse to what to economize actually means. If we look at the definition of that, it means to, to preserve our resources in the most diligent manner with uh, the most reduction of waste that's absolutely possible. Our system today does pretty much the exact opposite of that with uh, consumption at the heart of it. Consumption drives everything. The faster, the better for, the, for, the, for GDP and for the profits uh, of uh, all the companies within that uh, economy. So. All these problems, war, poverty, uh, environmental decline, these are just symptomatic of the, the goal of, of trying to consume as much as we possibly can. The competitive, the competitive uh, framework that governs our entire economic system, where companies have to adhere to cost efficiency rather than uh, a technical efficiency. So pretty much immediately, all products that are created are inherently inferior by design because the need to adhere to this cost efficiency, in, which is in order to uh, you know, increase your profitability and, and increase your market share. So you can't have both cost efficiency and technical efficiency uh, together, they're, they're simply inverse. So if we were to talk about uh, a system that was actually economizing, it would be one that would be designed from the ground up to take into account what the earth can actually support, to reduce consumption as much as possible, uh, basically to manage our resources on this planet in the most sustainable manner possible. That would, uh, that would be a true economy, and we can get into that more later. Well, now, from what you're saying about this, then, it sounds like a monetary economy has some effects on all aspects of our lives, including how we're governed. Uh, does, do you think the monetary economy has uh, any results as far as democracy is concerned? Well, it's pretty much paradoxical to have those two things together. I mean, first of all, there's never really been a democracy anywhere in the entire world. Uh, how can you have a democracy when you have unequal purchasing power, when you have monetary interests influencing government, legislation, political parties, and basically everything that happens in the economic system? 
anyways, democracy is essentially just mob rule. It's 51% of the population controlling or taking away the rights of the other 49%. So first of all, in a monetary system, it's impossible to have a democracy. And if you want to actually get into an economic system that actually works, meaning it actually provides the basic human needs to all people, the democratic uh, method for social decision making isn't really the way to go. It doesn't matter how much the majority of the public believes that they can you know, dance on the ceiling. Gravity will not allow them. So we need to adhere to what we actually know in the physical world and adhere to that uh, to gain our understandings for how we should conduct social operations. Do you see a collapse of the uh, present economic system in the near future? It's virtually inevitable unless the game of monopoly that we currently play is, uh, is, is halted. There's several key trends that we can look towards to understand uh, what the future of this economic system might hold. Uh, first of all, we've got, um, we've got the obvious discrepancy of living in a system of infinite growth while we live on a planet of finite resources. This is obviously a uh, mathematical incompatibility. You can't just have an economic system that grows forever when you have a finite amount of resources. So you've got this obvious unsustainable aspect inherent in any type of monetary or market system that requires growth. What we really need is a, a steady state economic system. And again, we can get into that. Another attribute we need to look at is, is technological unemployment. That's simply the displacement of uh, human labor through machine automation. And this is happening at an increasingly uh, faster rate than ever before in history. And that's basically the reason for the unemployment uh, throughout history. You know, 100 years ago, most people worked in manufacturing or agriculture. Now pretty much everyone works in the service sector. And now the service sector is even being uh, automated. So where's the, the next sector to absorb all these jobs lost? Well, there really isn't one and the, un the increased unemployment we're seeing globally uh, in the past few years uh, is the result pretty much of this machine automation. There's much statistic, statistical background to support this and if you understand the logic of the system these jobs really can't come back. It's, it's simply just it's just gonna get it's just gonna get uh, more and more pronounced. Uh, there's no sector to absorb these jobs. The jobs are simply not coming back, and that means that uh, the public has less purchasing power. Less purchasing power means less ability to support uh, the consumption levels needed to increase GDP, and it's basically, this translates into a, a failing monetary system. It basically means the end of a monetary system as we know it. Um, another attribute we need to look at is depleting oil reserves, or a phenomenon known as uh, peak oil. And we can speculate for a while how much there is left. The obvious reality is that oil is a non-renewable non energy resource, and um, it's, it's not going to last forever. In fact, it's probably only going to last a few more decades at most. And there's really nothing uh, that we can see in this society uh, in terms of a concerted effort to move or to shift the global energy infrastructure into something sustainable. We have the technology to do it, but I believe there is an... Uh, International Energy Agency study um, a few years ago that found that it would take 30 years and 20 trillion dollars to convert the global energy infrastructure into something sustainable. But do you really think that's going to happen in a monetary system? You know, we, we have the technical capability to do it. We can do it very fast. But uh, again, the monetary system will not allow it because of its need to maintain cost efficiency, to, uh, you, know, you know, basically for all companies to make a profit in what they do. If it's, if it's not profitable, it's simply not going to be done. So we've got peak oil, and then we've got uh, the skyrocketing debt collapses that's happening all over the world, which is, of course, just a fiction and can be stopped at any time. But uh, the consequences are very real. And uh, I think the global uprising that's happened in the last several years is largely a result of these debt pressures that are imposing austerity measures in many countries all over the world. You see protests happening all over the world and in the Middle East. We see the sovereign debt defaults of many countries in Europe and probably only a matter of time before the United States follows eventually. So you look at, take all these, these, uh, these trends and put them together and you really see that this system doesn't have much longer. It's completely unsustainable on, on almost every level imaginable. And the question I really have is not will it collapse, but when will it? And, or, or will people wake up in time to realize 
that the system doesn't work and, and just put a halt to it before it does completely collapse and, and destroy the planet or the species. Yeah. There are those who would say that these problems are self-perpetuated. They're brought in by consumers who overstretch their lifestyles and demanded entitlements. What would you say to these people? I would just say that this is, that's propaganda imposed on, or basically spewed out by the, by the status quo. Uh, things like planned obsolescence, people who defend the market system will say that that's consumer driven. This is, goes against the inherent logic of the entire system of having to adhere to cost efficiency. Every, every corporation has to do this and they'll cut costs wherever they can, which automatically means inferior products which automatically means they're going to design products to break down. So this is just an attribute of the system. When people say it's all consumer driven, that basically ignores the entire mechanics of how this system really works. Well, there are those who would also say that there's no solution for today's problems. Uh, the recent uh, movement by the Occupy Wall Street uh, group, the uh, Occupy Together uh, group, made their positions clear by addressing the problems, but they short, stopped short to address a solution. And won't these problems that they've been addressing uh, be addressed with legal uh, changes and regulations? It seems that there are more people who are trying to pose solutions from within the current political or social or economic framework. And this fails to take into account where these problems actually originate from, which is, of course, the, the, the economic system itself. If we don't go deeper to the lowest common denominator of where these problems actually originate from, uh, nothing is going to change. Legislation or, or regulatory efforts do nothing to address the, the root causes of where these problems originate from. Uh, it's simply a form of patchwork. And basically, when it really comes down to it, every law in the books is just more proof that this social system is insufficient in terms of actually uh, providing for, for everyone on this planet. The more regulation you need just shows that, uh, that this system, again, is a failure. Uh, you know, people who say that, uh, that this system will just work it out by going back to the free market, I mean, that, again, fails to take into account the mechanisms of how the system operates. So we need to look towards the very system itself, understand the mechanics within it, and understand that uh, it's the structure itself that causes a propensity for war, that causes this income inequality. Uh, this monetary market system obviously creates this, for example, income inequality. The more money you have, the more easier it is to make more money. Uh, if, you, if you have a million dollars and you put it into a bank at 5% uh, interest per year, you get $50,000 per year for doing absolutely nothing. A lower or middle income person uh, wants to get a mortgage for a house, he or she would have to go to the bank and uh, get a loan and pay interest. So you're essentially taking this money uh, from, the from the poor and giving it to the rich. So it's, it's basically a built-in classism uh, right in, in the very mechanics of the system. Some defenders of capitalism say we've gotten away from a free market economy, that what we have is crony capitalism or corporatism, and that returning to a truly laissez-faire free market capitalism would fix the problem. Yeah, this is one of my, one of my favorite uh, ones to address. It really just reveals the indoctrination uh, that these people have towards supporting this structure. First of all, uh, advocating such a position fails to take into account the obvious incentive for corruption within any type of market system, whether it's completely laissez-faire or even more, you know, further left-leaning. But you still have this incentive for corruption. You still have a propensity for war. If a country doesn't have the resources it needs and it's not getting along economically with them, they'll invade the country for, for resources. Every war has been about resources in, in one form or another. So to simply return to the free market uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If we, were to, if we were to reset the free market back to, say, how it was in the late 19th century in the United States, don't you think it would just be a matter of time before what we have today happens? I mean, remember, in a market system, everything is for sale, and that includes politicians, the governments, uh, legislation. All of these things can be influenced by corporate interests, There's, unless, of course, we have laws against that, but then that's not a totally free market. 
and now isn't. So, uh, so to simply return to a free market is to ignore uh, the mechanisms in that free market that, that allows it to be corrupted. You know, even Adam Smith understood that a purely laissez-faire economy would turn into, uh, you know, cons the, a conspiracy of uh, business interests to business interests to overtake uh, consumers, and as such, he never really advocated such a thing. Now, there's schools like the Austrian School of Economics who almost dogmatically uh, preach that uh, the free market will take care of everything and the so-called invisible hand will somehow work out for the benefit of, ever, of everyone. This is completely unfounded and when we get more into what a resource-based economy is, it will become even more clear how this system fails to simply uh, meet the needs of everyone on the planet and really optimize our social functionality. Well, no, the resource-based economy does sound interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so a resource-based economy uh, was d proposed by Jacques Fresco of the Venus Project. He's a 95-year-old industrial uh, designer and social engineer. Basically, this economic model transcends our understandings of capitalism, socialism, communism, transcends the entire mar monetary market system. And what it does is it provides goods and services to everyone on the planet uh, without the need uh, for money or any type of medium of exchange, no barter, no credits, no debt, nothing like this. The realization is we have enough food to feed the world's population many times over. We've got uh, renewable energies that can last us thousands of years. We've got incredible technologies that could raise the standard of living of everyone on earth to beyond what we can even imagine today. So the only thing stopping us is our current economic system that uh, will really only uh, you know, operate uh, on, on endeavors that are, that are profitable. We're saying in a resource-based economy, we simply do it if we have the resources and if, there's, and if it actually optimizes the collective, uh, the collective uh, humanity, basically. So a resource-based economy essentially would provide an access abundance to everyone on Earth because we have the technology to do this. It would it would look at what's the most efficient and therefore sustainable way of managing resources on a global scale, uh, taking, in terms of, uh, taking uh, into consideration the most efficient distribution systems, production systems, and basically the best ways to manage our resources. Um, basically this could be summarized as the application of the scientific method uh, for social and environmental concern on a global scale. And when compared to the methods of our current political system, it really is unparalleled. And that's another, that's another attribute. We want to dissolve the current political system and replace it with basically a scientific system for decision making. We don't want to elect people to make decisions for us. We want to uh, basically engage in, in statistical analysis, scientific research to arrive at the best decisions. It's, uh, the scientific method is the best method we've developed for uh, properly approximating what, uh, what reality is and as such we need to actually apply this on a social level rather than just in isolated pockets. It's time that our, that our social sphere be updated to what we actually know in terms of science and technology. And that's, that's a little bit about a resource-based economy. There's obviously many different attributes and you can watch uh, Zeitgeist moving forward, the third section called Project Earth which uh, explains all, all of these, all the inner workings of the system in great detail. Well, do you think immediately transitioning into a resource-based economy from a monetary-based economy would work right away? Aren't there aspects of human values and belief systems such as greed, self-focus, or aggression that play against such a system? It's, it's definitely a good point. I use the analogy of Say we took uh, someone from the Amazon jungle and we dropped them into the middle of uh, an urban North American city. They simply would not understand how to operate and their condition would be completely obtuse. Um, it's just basically the same uh, if you took someone from our monetary system today, you drop them into the future in a resource-based economy without orienting uh, them to the new social system. Uh, their condition would be obtuse to the extent that they would simply not understand how to operate and they probably just wouldn't work to the extent that they'd have to be uh, educated into this, into this new system. Um, so this is the, probably the most critical point here that we need to, to look at, and that's human values, is what, 
what human values work and what human values don't. We like to think that, uh, that all values are equal, that we all have the right to our own belief systems and that we're entitled uh, an amount of respect uh, for all these beliefs. But does that really make any sense? If, you know, if, if your value is, is to hold a gun to my head and, and uh, tell me that I deserve to die, am I supposed to respect that value of yours? So obviously values are not equal and in order to understand what values work we need to weigh them against uh, natural phenomena and see, see what sort of relevance they actually have in the, in the natural world. If you look at many of the values that our social system today uh, you know, creates and reinforces like uh, uh, all, the, all the consumptive ones from materialism and, and vanity and, and ego and the, and the jealousy and all the equi these acquisitive values, they're, they're simply unsustainable. So those values will not lead to uh, social betterment in a way. They're simply there because advertising and marketing drills them into people because that's what this system requires, the system based off of consumption. So we need to rethink our entire value system. And I would call that, we need to, I would say we need to move towards what we call a sustainable value system. And sustainable meaning it's aligning to the natural order of, of reality. It aligns to, to natural law. There's, there's many different social myths in society um, and they're addressed abundantly throughout the zeitgeist movement's literature. For example, uh, people's beliefs in, in human nature, that we're born a certain way, or our preference towards uh, a competitive, uh, a competitive tendencies, our beliefs in, in free will, or, or incentive, what actually motivates people. These things really need to be understood for, for what they actually are. To give you an example, um, our beliefs in free will, that people can simply make choices free from their environmental stimuli that, uh, that, that create these types of values. Uh, you, you, you simply, you know, if you're, if you're brought up in the, in the Middle East into a Muslim family and uh, you have no other influences with regards to other religions or other ways of life, what's the chance that you're going to become a Christian or Jewish or any other religion? Pretty low. So we need to understand that, uh, that we're essentially products of our environment, that our values come from the social system at large, our values and behaviors, and we need to understand this relationship. Uh, if you take the example of free will, it, this assumption extends uh, to the depths of society. Look at our, our prison and legal systems. Um, these systems are based on the assumption that people have free choice, that they commit these so-called criminal acts, and uh, we ignore the basis uh, in society for why these crimes, supposed crimes, actually take place. Crimes are just a response to social insufficiency or people being treated in a negative manner. So again, we need to move towards a sustainable value system, which would be values based on cooperation and compassion and empathy, uh, reciprocity, and basically a system where, uh, where the negative attributes of our system today are, are just are conditioned out. Well, now, what is the plan to put a resource-based economy in place? Well, if, if everyone in society or a majority of people in society uh, understood that this direction was beneficial, that we wanted to move towards it, and we were at the point in which we wanted to implement this then, the first step would be to do a survey of all earthly resources. It really makes little sense to start any other way. We need to know what we actually have on the planet before we can operate uh, or on any type of responsible manner with regard to efficient, sustainable use of resources. So you do a survey of all, re all resources on the planet, or as many as we uh, can locate at the current time with regard to mineral, minerals, iron ore deposits, uh, the most potent uh, locations for renewable energy, whether it be geothermal, solar, wind, wave, tidal, endless supply of renewable energies that we have. Uh, to all the different technological capabilities we have and how that applies to uh, efficient uh, production and distribution systems. So once we have this survey, we essentially apply it to the system. We, it basically is a, it's a self-generating system. Once we have the information, that information dictates how we then proceed. So it's not based on my opinion or your opinion or anyone else's opinion or even scientists' opinion. It's based off the best available information that we have at a certain time and essentially everything would unfold from the basic goal of efficiency and sustainability. Without the need for, for monetary exchange, this is an outdated concept and, 
uh, we simply don't, we just don't need it anymore. It, it uh, impedes social progress and does little, if anything, to actually uh, provide an incentive for, for advancing social progress. Well, uh, do you anticipate resistance from uh, those who profess to have a monetary economy? Sure. In, in the meantime, there are people who have an emotional inclination uh, towards supporting this system, and that's really what it is. It's, it's less of an intellectual struggle on our part than breaking through emotional barriers that have become so ingrained in people that they find it essentially painful to consider any other position, whether it be uh, from a religious background or political background or any type of economic dogma spewed out from the system. They're all, they're all the same in the sense that they're not uh, emergent uh, value systems. In a resource-based economy, people would be, would be educated to accept change very quickly. That's, that's the system we need. We need an emergent system rather than an established system. And people today are conditioned to have established value systems such that they cling on to it for dear life until, until something so drastic eventually challenges that value system and they're forced to shift. That's essentially the, the history of social change. If people are out of a job and out of their house, maybe then uh, even the most uh, ardent uh, free market capitalists will start to wonder and uh, question the very system it is that they support. In terms of the people at the top, people always ask, well, how do you expect to convince the people at the top, the top 1%? You know, if we have a majority of people who understand a uh, new socioeconomic system, such as a resource-based economy, the people at the top are going to have very little say as to what the rest of society does. And even then, the people at the top would be so much better living in a resource-based economy with all the reduced stress, the access, abundance to essentially everything that they, it is they possibly require without any of the dangers that our current system poses on them. Even they're not uh, ex you know, exempt from uh, environmental pollution, uh, food contaminants, uh, income inequality, which actually affects even the richest in society, studies now conclude. So even they would be better off in, in this type of social arrangement. So uh, how does the timing of the global uprising that we're experiencing now come into play with the implementation of a resource-based economy? I think we're at a point in time now where many thresholds have been crossed in terms of being able to accept this system and just carry on with business as usual, so to speak. Um, the protests are probably a testament to the fact that social conditions are worsening for a majority of people in the world, and they're starting to wake up to the fact that this system doesn't serve them in their best interest. So to directly answer your question, it's, it's almost like a catch-22 because if society completely collapses, it's going to be a lot more difficult to spread awareness about a new possible uh, social system. At the same time, um, if this system maintains itself for much longer, we may pass the point of uh, no return environmentally and it will become you know, impossible to even implement this type of thing. I don't know when we would pass that, uh, that, that point, but uh, basically it's a very delicate balance we need to walk and essentially the Zeitgeist Movement uh, understands that we just need to move forward with, uh, with this information and work as hard as we possibly can to get this information out there. Well, how can people find out more about the Zeitgeist Movement? You can go to thezeitgeistmovement.com. That's our official global website where you can link to all the other chapters in the world. You can find uh, our orientation guide, which dictate or which uh, basically denotes the trains of thought advocated by the movement and all the support, uh, supporting evidence for how we've arrived at this resource-based economy. There's a, many different lectures uh, that you can that you can uh, view. Um, as far as locally, uh, Zeitgeist Vancouver is active on pretty much a weekly basis in downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Art Gallery, where we uh, engage passers-by with uh, DVDs, engage in meaningful discussion, and and uh, just distribute as much information as we can to try to reach as many new people as possible. Uh, this has been our best method that we've found for, uh, for activism as opposed to say closed type meetings where uh, you're essentially preaching to the choir so to speak. I mean these, these things are, are important to get more information out there for people who are interested but uh, the most critical work that we do I think needs to be in, in reaching new people and that's where our efforts uh, efforts lie. So as far as our local website, you can go to zeitgeistvancouver.com and you can uh, 
uh, read all about our events that we've done in the past as well as our upcoming ones, all the different local media we've done, uh, as well as just everything else that's relevant uh, on a local level.